We're in the agency uh, chapter. Let's go ahead and get started on that. Hey, listen, guys. This chapter, words are used very specifically. Words are used very specifically. As I start going through the vocabulary, be aware of that. And if you have a question about what it means, make sure that you ask me. So where, where are you going with that, Chris? Okay? And we will get you straight on this. We do extraordinarily well. We're getting ready to embark on about 20 hours of talking about agency and contract. So lock yourself in. It's going to be a long call. Let's start off literally talking about the law of agency. Here's what I want you to understand about the law of agency. The law of agency are laws rules and court cases laws, rules and court cases that dictate the way agents should act with their clients laws, rules, court decisions that dictate the way that agents should act with their clients and I will go ahead and tell you, I'm using the word agents and clients very specifically. When someone calls you an agent, it has a very specific meaning, which we will get to. If I tell you someone is a client, that has a very specific meaning, which, by the way, don't write this down right now, is going to be different than the word customer. Okay? That's how specific we're going to be in this class. The law of agency, how should you act with your client? Now, having said that, here's another precursor to what we're going to be talking about. Courts hate conflicts of interest. Courts hate conflicts of interest. Do you think you as a real estate agent will ever be in a situation where you have a conflict of interest? Can you tell me what it is, Melissa? Okay. Uh, what she described is what we will later refer to as dual agency. Now, I'm going to ask conversation of dual agency be put off for a while. It'll come up, come up, and each time I'm going to push it off because I feel like you need to understand agency first. But do you understand what she said? If I'm working with both the buyer and seller in the same transaction, clearly there's a conflict of interest. i got to be honest with you. There's actually a much more basic conflict that you'll run into every single time that you're a buyer's agent. I don't know if you're aware of this. But buyer's agents typically are paid from the transaction. What I mean by that is in, in residential, your buyer rarely pays you. You're usually paid by a listing agent. They put it in the MLS and they say, I'll pay you X percent if you bring me a buyer. Who does the listing agent work for? Seller. The seller. Who's the buyer's agent work for? The buyer. The buyer's agent is getting paid by the other party. Isn't that weird? Do you know how buyer's agents are typically paid a percentage of the sale price? So you're talking about conflict of interest. If the buyer pays more, I make more money. But what's my job? Get the buyer with well, the best deal, the best bargaining position. It may not always be best price, but of course that's what most people think of first is the uh, price. Anytime you're a buyer's agent, there is an inherent conflict of interest. So courts hate conflicts of interest. How do we deal with these things? You're going to find out this chapter is a lot about disclosure. If you will simply inform and educate the public and let them make informed decisions, that's how we protect ourselves. And not only do they make informed decisions, then we make, it, make them memorialize it in writing, in agency agreements and disclosure forms. So they can't come back later and say, well, why didn't you tell me who you were working for? Not only did I inform you who I was working for, but I had you sign a document that indicated who I was working for. If you will bless you, if you will do your job on this, you will find that this chapter is in fact a breeze. As a matter of fact, I will make agency easy for you right now. When someone calls you their agent, I want you to think of it as, have you ever seen one of those commercials where you have like the person on your shoulder over here talking in your ear? Anytime you're acting in a transaction, just assume that your client is sitting right here on your shoulder. Because if your client could hear everything that you say, you would be very careful about what you say, aren't you? You know what? The real estate agents have not always had the best perception. If you look at respectability in industries, you will see that real estate agents are pretty far down on that list. We're above new car sales, I mean, uh, used car salespersons. If any of you are used car salespersons, I apologize, but come on, let's be realistic. That's where the <coughs> reputations are. And real estate agents are not far above that. Do you know why? I think the public perceives that here's what happens. 
you have a buyer, you have a seller, and then you have these two agents, and these two agents want to get paid. So what they do is the buyer's agent, if they believe that it's going to help facilitate things, the buyer agent may go to the listing agent and say, yeah, my buyer's willing to go a little bit more. You think your seller can come to this number right here? They think that we put together these backroom deals or something, and then we go back and tell them. That is not the case. What we need to do is educate, inform, disclose, and then buyers and sellers, by definition, are adults. Okay? They should make their own adult educated decision. All right? And we should document every step of this process. Agency is not hard. Agency is tedious, and it requires certain things of you, but it's not uh, hard. So let's talk about what some of these uh, words uh, mean. As an agent, the person that you work for is going to be known as your principal. Remember I told you that in this chapter, words have very specific meanings. The word principal and client mean the same thing. That is okay. You can use the word principal and client synonymously. On the other hand, the third party to you is going to be known as a customer. The third party is going to be known to, a, to you as a customer. So if I am a buyer's agent, if I am a buyer's agent, who is my client? The buyer. If I'm a buyer's agent, who is the customer to me? The, the seller. Yeah, he's a third party to me. Now listen, there are going to be rules about the way I treat my buyer. I have to be loyal to them and some other things. I'll show you in just a minute. Okay. To a third party, though, Remember, your license, your real estate license, the Real Estate Commission writes this course. The Real Estate Commission is a regulatory organization. Regulatory organizations are created to protect the consumer, right? Your real estate license is a certificate of public trust. So therefore, even though I'm being loyal to my client, doesn't mean I cheat the other guy, right? I have to be honest and fair to them as well. So I owe some things to my client, I owe a different set of things to a uh, customer. I don't have to be loyal to a customer, but I can't cheat them. You will get a chance to write those down in just a moment. Another word for a third party is a customer. Make sense? All right? We'll do an exercise later, so I'm skipping that for right now. Just like every chapter, we set up a little bit of vocabulary. You've heard some of it. So let's run through this list and just make sure that we have your vocabulary down. An agent. Definition of an agent, listen closely, is someone legally authorized to act on behalf of another party. An agent is someone who is legally authorized to act on behalf of another party. Legally authorized to act on behalf of another party. When someone calls you a real estate agent, it is suggesting that you have a legal relationship and I'll go ahead and mention this now. It'll come up many times throughout this uh, class. As an agent, you and your client are considered to be the same legal entity. You and your client are as one. If you do something stupid, it could affect your client. Okay? Agent. Subagent. Let's keep this simple. Subagent. A subagent is an agent of an agent. A subagent is simply an agent of an agent. All right, we're going to start off simple, but we're going to get complicated very, very quickly, okay? Let me talk to you about the basic sub-agency uh, relationship. When you go to work for the firm, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but all agency relationships are in the name of the firm. When I take a listing, I don't take a listing as me. I take the listing as ABC, okay? And then I sign for ABC. So who is the actual agent of the seller if I take the listing? The firm. The firm. Okay. ABC is the uh, agent. Right? Now, obviously, I'm the one who took the listing and I'm going to get paid. So let's call Chris a sub-agent. Why am I a sub-agent? Because I am an agent of the agent. So far, so good? Yes, Say like, just as an example, the ABC would be someone like Remax. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, Remax at Go in our particular uh, case. Yeah. Now a little bit later when we get into this, um, the only reason I use something generic like this is simply because you get into things dealing with uh, like franchises and stuff like that, which is a little bit more complicated. 
Remax is actually a franchise. Remax United would, would actually be the firm. Okay, you'll see why that's important in just a little while. Okay, so some agency, that wasn't that difficult, was it? I am an agent of an agent. Oh, here's what I forgot to tell you. Everybody in this classroom, everybody in this classroom is with ABC Realty. Congratulations, I just gave you your license and you just went to work for ABC uh, Realty. All of you signed agency agreements with ABC, you work for ABC. Now, all right, what's your relationship to that seller right now there if you're with ABC? Because they're a sub agent. Okay. She in? Right? Did I get it right? Okay, good. What's your relationship to the uh, seller? You're a sub agent of the seller. I can keep going on. You do understand this, right? Everyone in this office right now is an agent, technically a sub agent of the seller. Meaning you owe your loyalty to whom? The seller. The seller. Who's going to get paid? And what will get paid? I'm the one who procured the business. But all of you became an agent of the seller the minute that I took the listing. Are you with me so far? Is this important? Yes. Yeah, let me tell you why this is important. Oh, I don't know if you guys have figured this out yet or not, but uh, you're probably going out, or you will over the next few weeks, be going out and visiting our real estate companies. I highly recommend that you visit on a Tuesday. Tuesdays is when they have their office meetings. And on Tuesdays, you always get fed in real estate. <laughs> you chuckle, but the fact of the matter is, sometimes this can be a lean business in your early months. It takes a while to get the business going. So never pass up free meals if you get an opportunity. On Tuesday mornings, you usually have an office meeting and someone brings in like uh, donuts and stuff like that. Of course, you know, people lately start bringing in like fruit and vegetable platters. I don't know why people eat that stuff. <laughs> But it used to be donuts and bagels, so if you get lucky, maybe you'll want to get that. And then in the office meetings, it's not uncommon for us to stand up and talk about our listings. Hey, I just got a new list, and I want you guys to know about it. Bring your buyer's body if you get a chance. So let me tell you what happened today. Today, we are in our office meeting. Now remember, we all work for the same company. We all work for the seller, right? And so I'm telling you, this listing that I had, look, they've had some of my tough luck lately. They really need a quick sell on the house. I'm not willing to put this out publicly yet, but for you guys, if you, if you have buyers that are interested in this area, bring them by and listen. My seller might actually consider a lower offer for the uh, quick close. I'm not ready to make that public yet. However, you guys, I want you to be aware of if you have any buyers that are uh, interested. Later that day, after the office meeting, we do a company caravan where we all jump in our cars and we go out and look at the listing because I want you to look at it with fresh eyes. They put some paint on the walls and stuff like that. So we go out and show you that uh, property, okay? So that's done. I feed you again. We have an open house at like 11.30, a broker open. We feed you at 11.30. If you're really smart on Tuesdays, you can sometimes get a late broker open at around 2 o'clock as well. So you can eat three times. Now, I don't encourage you to take a doggy bag, but nobody ever says anything. So if you need to, that's, that's fine. Later that day, you're at the CVS. You're standing in line at the CVS, and you have your badge on, right? You do wear your badge, don't you? Because if you have your badge on, it identifies you as a real estate agent. People will talk to you. Matter of fact, sometimes people will talk to you even if you don't want them to talk to you. If you have that badge on, they feel like that gives you them the right to talk to you. So you're sitting at the CVS one day, you're actually standing in line, and you see the person behind you craning their neck, and they're looking. Are you a real estate agent? Yes, in fact, as it turns out, I am a real estate uh, agent. Uh, and they start asking you questions. I recently moved to this uh, area. And listen, on the way to the CVS, I drove by this house. And it was a two-story colonial up there at the corner of Elm and Eugene. Do you know anything about that house? Listen, this is a happy day in your life. You just looked at that house at the broker open. And someone asked you about it in line at the CVS. These type of things will happen occasionally. You know what's beautiful about this? They ask you about this house. You just saw it less than two hours ago. You know everything there is to know about this house, right? And so you start answering, yeah, it's a three bedroom, two bad. It's on a four acre uh, lot of estimates in backyard, blah, 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 blah. You're talking about all the amenities. Everything you said so far is, cut, is okay, right? All you're describing is public information. They are wildly impressed. They believe if you know this one house, you know every house in the uh, area, okay? 
Well, they get excited as you're explaining, oh man, that sounds exactly like what I want. And then you start noticing buying signals. Do you know what buying signals look like? If you haven't come from a sales field before, you, you might not be familiar with this, but people start getting just a little bit antsy. The, the pace of their talking is a little mm -hmm. bit uh, faster than their heart rate gets up. If they're really excited, they'll break out and sweat right across their crowd. When you notice these things, you go in for the queue. It's time to close them, right? You're standing there at the CDS, and these are the words that come out of your uh, mouth. Listen, I can see that you're excited about uh, this. You might want to know this piece of information. I recently heard that the uh, sellers need a quick sell, and they might be willing to take a low offer so I can close quickly. What just happened? Conflict of interest. Who do you actually work for? The seller. Who are you acting like you work for? The buyer. Do you see where sub-agency can get much more difficult than what people believe it is? Now listen, you may say that I made a mistake at the company uh, meeting. And to be quite honest with you, I think you probably should keep your mouth closed about confidential information unless you have been writing from the seller and giving you the authority to do so. But technically, I did nothing wrong. Do you know why I did nothing wrong? I was talking to other agents of the seller. Okay, the reason you did something wrong is now you just talked to a third party. You just talked to that customer. And it's not clear who you work for. And what you will find out is undisclosed agency, in this case, undisclosed dual agency, is actually a crime. It's not just bad form, it's a violation of a state law, 9386-4. You cannot work for more than one party in a transaction without the permission of both parties. Okay? So this is very important that you act accordingly all the time. And as an agent, you are always on the job. You have to watch your words so precisely. Are you okay with the concept of self-agency? You are technically an agent of an agent. When you go out and do your listing presentations, don't worry about calling yourself a sub-agent because you know what sub-agents owe to the client? Same thing the agent owes. So there's no reason to refer to yourself as a sub-agent. Yeah? I just wanted to clarify, you said that um, you can't work as an agent for both parties. In that exact scenario, you said as long as you haven't disclosed that information about the seller and you can put a sale, that person you can say, why don't you come down to my office, let's look at some properties together, and you could represent them as a buyer, you just can't give the information about the seller wanting to put a sale, right? In that particular case, I would only be able to represent them as a dual agent. Yeah. Okay, so let me correct you on something that you said just a moment ago. I never said you couldn't work for both parties. Oh, without the Without the permission. Okay. You can't do it without the permission. There is a way that this could have been handled correctly, but you will never give up confidential information about your client. Okay. Is that yeah. permission from the both parties? Boss. Um, no, no, no. Both parties, the buyer and the seller. Okay. And we have forms for this. Remember, I'm pushing dual agency down the road, but once we get to dual agency, I'll show you how to deal with that. We'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of dual agency, but the key to dual agency is it's you, you can't do it unless you have the written consent of both parties at the appropriate time. Okay? Never spread confidential information. I will tell you that that's probably one of the biggest mistakes I think agents make is that sometimes when they, we all go to the same parties, we all go to the same cocktail parties and stuff like that. And I'm telling you, if you can't keep your mouth shut, don't have more than one drink. If you start talking when you have two drinks, stop at one. Okay? Because I've, I've heard it before cocktail parties. I'm like, I can't believe she just said that. Because if I ever had a buyer, I'm going to take advantage of that information if it uh, comes up and she's not in my uh, firm. Be careful about uh, that. Uh, principal, do you remember I said that principal was the um, synonymous with client? So let me give you a definition that will work for both the word principal and client. And a principal is simply the party that an agent is authorized to work for. The party that an agent is authorized to work for. But weirdly enough, I would suggest you underline the word for, F O R. You're like, good grief, I can't believe I'm underlining a preposition. How important can that be? In this chapter, the word for is actually important. You work for a client, you work with a third party. Okay? I mean, it could literally be that strictly interpreted. Principle, that is the party that an agent works for. That's the one that you owe your fiduciary responsibilities to. Speaking of which, if I'm going to throw out big words, I should tell you what they mean. 
Look at the word fiduciary. The word fiduciary, just think of that as meaning trust. A fiduciary relationship is a relationship of trust. You are a, in a fiduciary relationship with your client. You're within, you have a, a, a relationship of trust. Actually, the word fiduciary could be used as a noun as well. Okay? You could say, I am a fiduciary of a particular uh, party. Okay? A trust relationship. Needless to say, the words I skipped there, agency and uh, sub-agency, we describe what an agent is. Agency just describes the relationship that you have with a uh, party. The agent's the one who has the relationship. Agency describes the relationship with the party. You got it all down pat so far? Okay. Let's talk real quickly. Let's go back to sub-agency for just a moment. Go back to sub-agency for just a moment. Prior to the early 90s, prior to the early 90s, there was no such thing as buyer agency in residential real estate. Okay. Prior to the 90s, do you know who all agents worked for in a real estate transaction? They all worked for the seller. Do you have any idea why it was assumed that all agents worked for the seller in the uh, uh, 80s? Y'all said it? I think you said it. That's who pays them. I, I knew I heard it somewhere. It's because the seller paid the commission, right? And the seller also had the thing to sell. So everybody worked for the seller. There was a listing agent, but even the agents that had the buyer in the car were working for the seller. There was no buyer agency. Can you see where that might be confusing? to buyers. I'll tell you how confusing it was. In the late 80s, they actually did a survey. The Federal Trade Commission did a survey. They asked buyers. They said, hey, buyer, in your last transaction, who was the, in your last real estate transaction, who was the agent driving you around? Who did that agent uh, work for? And somewhere to the tune of 75 to 78 percent of buyers said, well, of course my agent worked for me. Well, that didn't exist prior to the uh, 90s. So why did these why did these buyers believe that the agents worked for them? Why do you think the buyers believe that the agents worked for them? Yeah. 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 Okay. The reason I'm letting Ebony just go on right now, she's getting very close to the fact. What she just described is that the agent was doing all these things uh, for them. They were helping them find houses, right? They were helping them write up offers and things like uh, that. Technically, they can do that as a seller sub agent. But you know what I think the agents were doing? The agents were getting to know their buyers. They were getting to feel a closeness. I mean, I can look at you guys and tell that y'all are good people. You're warm people. You like other people. I hope you like other people. If not, you might want to reconsider your field. Uh, but you're going to get close to them. You spend three or four weeks with them, you're going to build a bond with them. Don't you want the best for that buyer after you build a bond? Don't you want to see them get the best deal in this transaction? You just cross the line. Yeah, you just cross the line. Back in the 80s, buyer agency didn't exist. When you start trying to get the best deal for the buyer, who are you harming? Sell. Potentially the seller. Okay. So that's why buyers, it's not the buyer's fault. It's never the consumer's fault fault. It's our fault for not explaining who we uh, work for. This became untenable and for the buyers to be this far off not understanding. That's why in the early 90s uh, commissions all across the country agreed to uh, agreed and set up the appropriate rules to allow for buyer agency. So in the early to mid 90s that's when you saw the advent of buyer agency. The advent of buyer agency. Now a buyer could have their own agent. So let's talk about what changed. What changed is the buyer now has their own agent. Let's talk about what didn't change. The seller still paid the commission. An important thought for you to understand, and when you're looking at some of these test questions as well, is to understand that, listen to this, this sounds weird. The person that pays you may not be the person that you work for. Isn't that weird? Okay. Who pays you does not determine who you work for. What determines who you work for are your agency agreements. That's where we're going today, actually over the next several days. This is important stuff. Let me close out that conversation about seller sub-agency by suggesting this to you. There is a buyer. The buyer 
is working with an agent with XYZ. You know what? Today, that agent can work for the buyer, or that agent could legally work for whom? The seller. It's legal to do exactly the way we did it prior to the uh, 90s, okay? However, today, given the opportunity, most buyers, given the choice, are going to accept, uh, are going to expect buyer agency, right? That's what they're going to law. They don't have to, though. That buyer could choose to be unrepresented. He's like, I'm okay if you work for the guys. So this would be known as cooperating seller sub-agency. Why cooperating? Because they're with a different firm, and they're cooperating with this agent who has the list. All right? This is still legal. Now, listen, I know I'm projecting forward on this, and you may have no basis of believing me or not believing me, but at some point, I'm going to ask you a test question based on this concept right here. And someone, I predict it's Erica, is going to come up to me and say, what buyer in his right mind would do this? And I'm going to say, none, but it doesn't matter. Don't fight the questions, Erica. The questions are what they are. And this is a perfectly legal thing to do today. That buyer can choose to be underrepresented and that agent right there. It's exactly the way we did it for the 90s, right? It's not illegal today, given the option most buyers choose buyer agency. Okay? You'll get to see that later in questions. But in order for that to happen, you have to be a written consent? Let's assume that all of this is being done with informed consent at the appropriate time, reduced to writing, and later today, I hope. If not today, certainly on Friday, I'll show you where to get this consent. Because it's important, isn't it? You know what? If a buyer said, I don't want to be represented, two things would go through my mind. The first thing would be, well, I don't think you understood what I said. Because you have absolutely nothing to lose in buyer agency. You're not paying me one way or the other. I'm being paid out of the transaction. So let me go over it again. But if they still choose to, uh, uh, to not be represented, I want them writing somewhere. So when they come back later and say, why did you tell him I would give him more? Because I work for the seller. I told you I work for the seller. You signed a document saying you understood I work for the uh, seller. Does that make sense? Yep, see why. Who has their hand up first? Here. Okay, um, so back up for these definitions. Okay. Um, so agent is a person who is agency. Describe the relationship, correct. So, again, a sub-agent is a person. Correct. It's just, yeah, the, the relationship and the fact that you are working through an agent or an agency. Okay, yeah. And then customer, of course, down at the bottom. Customer yes. and third party. Okay. And that's the way. That's right. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Set so, up. Oh, I'm sorry, Beth, let me show you. That's okay. What if I walk into like a new home community? Okay. And I do not have an agent with me? All right. Who? Who is the builder representing? Builder or they okay. me? Don't take any notes on this yet. Okay. Let me tell you a couple of things here. First of all, not all builders are represented by agents. One of the things that you'll learn, and it's a little bit early right now, you'll you get a chance to read this this weekend, but um, oftentimes agent, uh, excuse me, builders are represented by employees. So when you walk into the office, you might be dealing with someone who's not a real estate agent, but an employee. And you say, wait a minute, Chris, the first day of class, you said I had to have a real estate license to be compensated. Every law has exemptions. Every law has exemptions. And one of the exemptions to having a real estate license and selling real property is that if you're an employee of a corporation, a bona fide W-2 salaried employee of a corporation, you can sell the property of the corporation and not have to have a real estate license. So sometimes you will be dealing with someone who is literally an employee of the uh, builder. And if that's the case, who do they represent? They clearly represent the builder, okay? And they don't owe you any of this stuff that we're talking about. They're not agents. However, it's not uncommon for builders to be represented today by a builder marketing group. And the building mar builder marketing group, these are licensed agents. Now, the answer to Beth's question is they still work for the builder. If they're doing a good job, they probably have it posted all over the place that they work for the uh, builder. But having said that, if they're agents, here's the good news, Beth. They should disclose to you that they work for the builder. And most of them that are on-site agents, well, I'm not going to say most, they may or may not be able to offer you dual agency. 
Okay, but they, because they're agents, they will have to go through the process of describing who they work for. Okay. Great question. We'll get into more detail on that a little bit about that. All right. Notice this slide. You're going to see a lot of red in uh, chapter uh, 7. Okay, a lot of red stars up here. This is highly critical stuff, highly testable stuff. This actually is not that difficult, though. If you like mnemonics, uh, when we start talking about, please look at the top of the slide. Agents, responsibilities to whom? The principal. What's another word for principal? Client. You're getting ready to see a list of what you owe to your client. I bet you before the day's over with, I will also show you a list of what you owe to a customer. Okay? This is what you owe to a client. If you like mnemonics, we use old car. You'll sometimes hear me use loads, because that's what I'm used to, L-O-A-D, and then skill. But anyway, old car or loads, they both say the same thing. Let's talk about each one of these points individually. What do I owe to my client? I owe obedience. Now, I want you to write this down specifically. You will obey the lawful and ethical request of your clients. If you didn't catch the emphasis there, you will obey the what? Lawful, Lawful and ethical request of your clients. Now you look smart. I'm going to assume that you're not overly naive. Will your clients ever ask you to do anything illegal or unethical? You betcha. You, you betcha. You. Will you obey if they ask you to do something illegal or unethical? No. Yeah. You will educate. And if they continually ask you to do something illegal or unethical, you are probably going to have to drop that client. Okay? You can't obey and then stand in front of some tribunal someday and defend yourself by saying, well, my client asked me to do that, and that's why I did this illegal, unethical thing. Okay? Jen. I, I think I was thinking about it. So, a client can be like if you're the selling agent? Uh, let's not use that word. Okay. Let's say the seller's agent. Okay. You're the listing agent, okay? Yeah, the customer can be the, the buyer. Cu- the customer would be the buyer to you. Okay. Okay? And if you're the buyer's agent, just the opposite. Okay. okay? All right, you will obey the lawful and uh, ethical request. In just a moment, we will talk about some of these things that your client might ask you to do. For example, if you are a listing agent and you know that the basement floods during the rainy season, it hasn't rained in four weeks, you have the listing. Are you going to tell the buyer that the basement floods when it rains? Yes. Yes. Why? Not because it's going to help you sell the house but because you have to. We'll later talk about this as a material fact. Okay? Your buyer, your seller may say something to the effect of, don't disclose that, they'll never find it out. If I know it, I'm obligated. It's a defect with the house. I have to disclose it. Okay? Another option is seller, you can fix it. If you fix it, I don't have to disclose it if there's no lingering effects uh, from it. Okay? You will obey the lawful and ethical request of your clients. Feel good about that? Loyalty probably needs to have a star beside it. Loyalty probably needs to have a star. This is the uh, thing. You owe undivided loyalty, undivided loyalty to your client. There was nothing not important about that statement. Undivided loyalty to your client. I've already given you a couple of examples of this.